Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, home of all things stock, investment, and personal finance related. Now for today's video, and backed by popular demand, we have a special guest from HUD8 Mining, Sue Ennis, here to answer some viewer or subscriber questions. I'm really excited to get into this one, but before we do, please take a second, hit the like button, you guys. It's a huge help to myself and the channel. If you're not already subscribed, feel free to do so, McNally Money. And let me know in the comments section below if you're currently holding shares of HUD8 Mining, what you think about this company's business model, and how you think they stack up to some of the other Bitcoin miners in the crypto mining industry. Now with that being said, let's get into today's video. Okay guys, so thanks so much for joining us today. We're joined by the VP of Investor Relations from HUD8 Mining, Sue Ennis, backed by popular demand to answer some Q&A questions and give us a little bit of insight into this business. So Sue, thanks so much for being uh, with us here today. Hi guys, love your channel. Happy to be back here chatting with you guys. It's obviously been a really, really crazy couple of months and pumped to get into it with you. Awesome. Okay, so to, to kick things off, Sue, for people who maybe missed your initial interview on the channel, can you give us a quick background on yourself, how you got to be part of HUD8 Mining and what the company is kind of all about? Yeah, absolutely. So my background is in the finance space. Um, I was uh, working uh, for investment managers and asset managers in Vesco and Manulife until about late 2016, when I was deeply, deeply disenchanted and honestly like dead inside, just watching some of the prehistoric processes that were running and underpinning um, the financial services space in Canada. Yeah. And so that's what that's when I started to research, you know, what sort of tech was going to disrupt you know, these these dinosaur systems. And that's when I learned about blockchain. That's when I learned about Bitcoin. Um, so I left the TradFi space in late 2016 and then got into crypto and blockchain in 2017. Although my real sort of like red pill, like head exploding moment was when I did a jungle survival course in Amazon Guyana. Okay. Um, it was two weeks and it was me and two logistics engineers for Doctors Without Borders and then a former former special British forces officer and then like a trauma therapist. Anyways, it was the five of us learning like jungle survival skills in, in the bowels of the Amazon. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of ways for city folk to die uh, in the Amazon. So we had this tribe that lived in the Amazon um, follow us around and just make sure, you know, we didn't step on a bullet ant nest or, you know, fall down a creek and get, you know, strangled by a boa constrictor. Um, and so at the end of the trip though, uh, a lot of them didn't know their birthday. They didn't have um, formal financial papers or identification. And so the, the sort of leader asked to be paid for um, their services in Bitcoin because they all had cell phones. Oh, wow. And that to me was like crazy because I was like, wait a minute, these people who could never normally um, participate in any sort of formal financial transaction because they don't have the identification to do it are able to have financial agency. So that was a big like moment for me. Anyways, that was a long winded answer. That's how I got into it. So it was like early, late 2016, early 2017, since I've been in the space and I've been at HUT for two years. Uh, Jamie, our CEO took the helm in December of 2020. She hired me about a week later and it's been a wild ride, but yeah, really pumped to get into some of your Q and A today. Awesome. Yeah. Great answer. I didn't know anything about your Amazon adventure. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's good context. Okay, so first question, uh, this is kind of burning on everyone's mind. We talked about it a little bit before we started filming here. I've had a lot of my subscribers asking about this. Uh, an update on the North Bay site, the Validus power situation, and kind of the status of that location at this point in time. For sure. So um, we currently have 109 megawatts in production in Alberta. That is where the bulk of our mining sites are. We love that province. And then about in 2021, we uh, signed a contract with Validus Power to stand up a third site in North Bay, Ontario. Um, so we had about 25 megawatts stood up. Um, and, you know, we there was a bit of a contentious, there was some contention around the contract in the sense okay. that, you know, we signed a contract with them for a certain price energy prices then went a different direction and then you know they're they i think there's just been a little bit of con contention around sort of some of the details in this signed contract um and look you know we've definitely been negotiating with them for quite a few months trying to find a resolution but as with any relationship sometimes you have to change the container in which you you try and come to an agreement 
um, AKA we are now in mediation. We were the first to it publicly issue a notice of default to Validus. But look, at the end of the day, um, we do think a more structured conversation process, AKA a mediation is a good thing. Yeah, They are good people. They're a great business. There's a reason why we wanted to go into business with them in the first place, because we really thought that there was a lot of great synergies here and for us to do something with them and for us together to disrupt the marketplace. Um, so yeah, we, we, we hope to come to a resolution. We feel confident that a resolution is available. Um, and also another benefit is that right now there's no cash. There's not really much cash out the door that's happening at that North Bay site, especially with Bitcoin trading where it is. That is, we do consider that a benefit right now because um, operations have been powered down. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the next point is, is that we've been very clear on our past two earnings calls that inorganic M&A is on our radar. Um, we've got the balance sheet to be very flexible and to go shopping for opportunity. And we have been looking at a few ideas since the summer, but um, the prices for these ideas and the the, the rationale, and the, the reasonability of sellers has certainly come down in a good way, for, at least for us as potential acquirers. Mm -hmm. um, so look, regardless of what happens with Validus, uh, we absolutely feel like we're in a position to capture major upside when the bull market comes back um, and be positioned very strategically moving into the next halving of 2024. Yeah, perfect. We're actually going to talk about that having event as well. And I appreciate the context on North Bay. Um, as we mentioned before, before we got into this today, if there's a good time to be shut down now is probably one of those good times. Um, and so just to be 100% clear, Sue, there is no potential risk or impact to any of the Alberta sites or their power supply at this point in time. Uh, Validus is not connected to the Alberta sites. At okay. All. That's business as usual there. Great. And I'm going to jump around a little bit on the list of questions here. Um, you said M&A activity could be on the horizon. The balance sheet's looking good. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of detail about, I know you guys authorized, uh, I think, a $200 million at the money or at the market uh, authorization. Have you started to dip into that at all? Or is that kind of what you're holding for the M&A activity? So, so we dipped into it a little bit in Q3. I think we took out like 2 million bucks. Okay. Um, but you know the the beauty of an ATM is that it's it's like a line of credit you can tap opportunistically. It doesn't mean just because you have a, have an ATM stood up that you're using it every day or even every week or even every month. So yeah, um, obviously legally there's only so many things I can talk about with our ATM, but I can certainly say that we're using it as an opportunistic tool, not as a lifeline. Um, because again, we you know when we last reported, we've still got like 33 million cash on the balance sheet. We have almost 9,000 Bitcoin unencumbered. So we haven't lent it out. We haven't levered it um, against anything. Um, and then we've got a totally uncorrelated business, our high performance computing business that's clipping. This is very conservatively with almost no sort of real growth mm -hmm. put into it. It's clipping like 4.4 million every quarter. So, you know, we've got a lot of and we have like almost no debt. So. So we've got a lot of flexibility here um, to, to, to grow. And like I said, we feel really confident in our ability to, to capture upside and get in, go guns a blazing into this next bear market, bull market. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's actually a question on the list here around that uh, HPC division. You said you're throwing off, I think, 4.4 million of top line revenue in Q3 was the number I saw. Um, what are the margins like on that business out of the out of the top line? How much are you keeping or fueling back yeah. into the kind of the Bitcoin mining operations? And have you signed any new noteworthy customers or is that kind of a, a status quo visit like stable, but same pace as where it was last year type of thing? Uh, so, no, we've definitely grown our customer base. Um, but again, it's this year. So we acquired the business in January for 30 million bucks cash, no debt. And the business actually came with 400 existing traditional high performance computing customers. So okay. like government special effects firms, gamers or gaming companies. Um, and so a lot of 2022 has been us sort of cleaning up that business because there's a reason why it went on sale. We, you know, we fired low margin product. Yeah. Um, we did some like minor tweaks and upgrades you know, uh, implemented this infrastructure called liquid stack so that we could provide composable compute to our customers, AKA if a customer wanted to go from like backing up their data to then maybe having a compute option because they want to add a machine learning com component to their, to their business. They can now do that all within house. Um, so, so, uh, it, 
Oh, sorry. So the margins are 35 to 40% margin. Okay. It's very sticky. It's a very sticky business. That's why we like it. Um, again, and it's completely uncorrelated to the Bitcoin digital asset mining space. So even if Bitcoin were to go to zero, we'd still have a business. We don't think Bitcoin is going to zero. That's why we are bullish on Bitcoin. But again, it's a real sort of hedge against this other piece of our business. And we do plan to continue to grow it. Um, I don't know if we, I don't think we've spoken since we signed Zenlayer. Okay. So that's a very meaningful partnership for us because Zenlayer is a cloud computing provider and they have a huge presence in Europe and Asia. And there's a lot of gaming companies, uh, particularly in Asia. And one of the problems that they were having as a cloud computing provider is um, the inability to offer them to offer their clients some of the custom composable compute that we're offering in our data centers. So again, let's say I'm a gamer and our, I'm a gaming company and I want to offer you know, NFTs to amplify my in-game experience, they were very limited in terms of the compute that was available to facilitate that business um, mm -hmm. amplification. And so they can now funnel those customers to HUD8. And it's great because we have like nine sales reps and they're awesome and they're pounding the pavement all over North America, but we don't really have, we don't have sales reps in Asia or Europe. So so for us to have that channel that's funneling us deals or and, you know potential clients is like very meaningful. Um, and yeah, we should have a look for our high performance competing business for 2023 coming out soon. Um, but yeah, we're really excited about it. And then just lastly, you know, even if you look at things like the growth of AI and the impact AI could have on on the crypto industry, yeah. it's incredibly meaningful, right? For AI to for um, AI being used to audit smart contracts, AI being used in trading algorithms. Again, in the HUT 8 infrastructure, you're as a as a provider, whether you're a crypto company or an AI company, we can help serve sort of both niches of those markets. And also, sorry, I said lastly, but just one more <laughs> one more point is it takes the guesswork for us, especially when the bull market comes back, as to who's gonna be the winner in web two, web two five, web three, because all of these different projects we're not betting on the racehorse because we are the racetrack. All of these projects, whether it be AI, machine learning, crypto, peer-to-peer -peer lending, or like just a traditional government, they all need data infrastructure. They all need disaster recovery. They all need composable compute. And we provide that. So we think that that's a real advantage. Yeah, amazing. And we've talked about uh, kind of how that's a major point of diversification uh, or differentiation, sorry, for HUD-8 compared to some of the other miners. Um, and I know well, as... I as Sorry. Really, really quickly on that point, even if you look at the, 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 the compound annual growth rate for the cloud gaming space, so like accessing a game via your computer, that's forecast at like 49.5% over the next five years. That's what we, that's what we're set up to, to serve. So sorry, I interrupted you there. No, no, all good. I know it's massive, especially in times of uh, bear market like this. I just, as an investor in HUD-8, I know it gives me a lot of confidence that we don't have kind of all the eggs in one basket type of thing. Um, so that's great. Thanks for giving an update on the margins and uh, the Zendesk. Um, acquisition or customer there. We've talked about that on the channel. I saw it in your investor presentation, but I don't think we spoke to it last time we chatted. Uh, now, shifting gears a little bit here. Um, actually, one thing before that. So it's, so because you have that alternate revenue stream, because you've got the ATM uh, available if needed and, uh, and your mining operations, you guys are still 100% hold on for dear life. No plans to sell any Bitcoin in the foreseeable future. Yeah, no, we're not touching that stack. Jamie, <laughs> our CEO, will not touch that stack. Okay. Um, AKA sell it, sell it. Uh, you know, we've certainly had discussions about it. Um, she's very, very, very bullish. She's not touching it. Now, is there a world where if we did an M&A and the, and the site that we bought was already producing and selling Bitcoin, like we'd certainly probably look at continuing to keep that business going if it was selling Bitcoin once it mined it because it'd be another iteration or another um, avenue for cash flow for us. But is Jamie touching her hodl? No, absolutely not. Because again, the bull market will come back. Yeah. Interest rates will come down. Um, AKA, you know, tech equities and Bitcoin miners do trade alongside tech um, and the NASDAQ. Uh, you know, we want to be in a place where if we see BTC back at 50, 60, 100K, which we think is possible, that we can build businesses, that we can earn yield, that we can, you know, maybe become one of the largest lightning node operators in, you know, in the industry. Like all of that is what the flexibility 
that this hodl gives us also it goes if we were to sell now it goes against our whole ethos of like why would you like like sell low buy high, no sorry sell yeah buy low, you're sell right, high, right? <laughs> yeah i don't know why that was so hard for me to, i need a coffee um but yeah so no we're not touching it and jamie is like really bullish on not touching it nice yeah i'm glad to hear that uh, so shifting gears a little bit now, Sue, um, we saw some legislation come out in New York talking about a two-year moratorium on proof-of-work mining activity, so Bitcoin mining activity. Uh, what's your stance on the Canadian government here? I know you guys are 100% Canadian exposure. We've talked about that on the channel. Another differentiator um, compared to some of the companies that operate in South America and the States. Do you see any risk of government intervention here or any similar type of legislation coming into play? Look, I think I think that, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time uh, building relationships with regulators and politicians on both sides of the aisle. We're friends with everybody. Okay. Um, we are really focused on education. So, for example, the White House came out with their digital asset report in September, and they actually explicitly called out that Bitcoin miners may be a potential solution for mitigating methane emissions mm -hmm. just because of affordability. And so they solve for a lot of, you know, issues that come with, let's say, the landfill space. If a landfill is mitigating, um, emitting methane, which they all do, but sometimes most of them are not big enough to warrant actually putting up a power plant to capture that 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 methane emission, but that's where miners come in because they're portable, they're incentivized to use low cost power. So um, education is a big, big, big priority for us. I mean, we do not at the at the moment see any particular risks on the horizon. But again, as you know, things things change and we've certainly got the relationships on the hill that we feel comfortable with that can help us at least create regulation in the spirit of innovation. So. Um, I mean, we have seen some changes from a regulatory perspective in Newfoundland, and we are seeing some in BC, but in Alberta, we're, we're, we've got a pretty accommodative um, government there to industry. Okay, great. Yeah, I know uh, some of the other companies we follow on the channel operating in South America, they're dealing with some import restrictions and stuff like that, which again is, is one of the reasons I, I like HUD-8 compared to the, the others in this space. Um, well, now and that's so, so Jamie, our CEO, her background, she's um, the data data transformation mandate specialist. So she worked at IBM BlackBerry transforming infrastructure. And she actually when she was at BlackBerry, she ran the South America division. OK, so she has firsthand experience of and an and understanding of how difficult it can be to get your assets or your money out of those locations. Yeah. If the, the government changes their mind, which they often do. So that's why she was not, I mean, obviously never say never with Hutt, but she, she's, we have, she was not interested in going to South America. Yeah, agreed. Fair enough. And you see that with traditional like mining resource companies as well. And it's just, there, there's more hoops to jump through, I guess. Uh, now you mentioned this a little bit earlier, the upcoming Bitcoin halving event in 2024. Um, this was actually specifically a subscriber question. What is Hutt's main goal moving into that having event is it just staying afloat getting through the bear market is it m a is it growing the, the hpc stuff what's kind of your primary focus from now till then so m a for sure is okay. on our radar we've explicitly said that on our past earnings calls um we're very bullish on on getting as much bitcoin on our balance sheet going into the next having i think though you know from a five to ten year perspective um the HPC space is very, very interesting because we see a world where, where basically Bitcoin, blockchain, all those companies and traditional HPC is actually going to merge. So so we are very bullish on HPC as sort of a longer term strategy. But moving into the next halving, we are incredibly interested on accumulating as much Bitcoin as possible. Great. OK, sounds good. And uh, a little bit outdated news now, but we, we just saw BlockFi kind of go the same way. What's your take on FTX, all the drama going on right now in the media? Um, I know I've talked to some other leaders in the space and, and they're saying, hey, you know what? It's not an issue with the protocol. It's an issue with the people behind it and traditional greed and, and fraud kind of situation um, really shouldn't tarnish the, the mining industry or Bitcoin. But you know how it is. There's always kind of that guilty by association. So what's yeah. your take on that, Sue? My take would be anyone who says, you know, this is crypto's fault, not a human led 
platform and human element yeah. problem, I would say go look at the history books. This exact same thing happened when the railroads, with Union, with Union Pacific, when the railroads came to town, um, with Enron, you know, in the 2000s. Like this, this isn't a new problem when you have, you know, a group of elites who don't have a lot of controls then taking advantage of that sort of opacity into their business. Mm -hmm. um, so we welcome the grifters getting flushed out of the system. We welcome more, you know, regulation in the spirit of protecting investors. Um, Bitcoin continued to do what it's always been doing, AKA add block after block, the 200 million people using the network continue to use the network un uninterrupted. So um, this is this is what happens when there's, you know, a lack of controls uh, and there's a centralized human led platform, you know, humans are fallible, we're all fallible. So that that's what the real problem was here. Me personally, again, I've been in the industry since late 2016, early 2017, I'm pretty pumped. And for what I hope is the, the, the end of this sort of hero worship culture in crypto, where like, you know, we start worshiping, quite frankly, like a punk ass kid who was super disrespectful on in investor calls, like, we all thought it was really funny when he was playing video games as he was closing, closing investor calls and deep down he was just a sociopath who didn't know how to manage books, right? Like it's, yeah. I'm pumped for that, that hero worship to hopefully go away. Um, but again, who knows? Humans, we also love a hero. So um, yeah, we do not look at it as a bad thing. Again, Hut has no exposure to FTX. Um, we recalled our coin from Galaxy and Genesis long, uh, right around the time when Terra Luna started collapsing because Jamie was definitely uh, nervous about that. And so yeah. all of our is in cold storage. We're not doing anything with it. We, we plan to put it back to work once things sort of calm down a little bit. But no, right now we're just sitting pretty on it in cold storage. Yeah, safe spot to be. That was going to be a question. I know you mentioned the cold storage last time too. Okay, great. So that's kind of it for the viewer questions. I know we've got a couple of minutes left. So just to wrap things up, Sue, um, in your opinion, and we've talked about a few of them, why should investors choose HUT or miners over just holding Bitcoin, number one, and, and why HUT specifically if they choose to hold a miner? For sure. So um, HUT versus holding Bitcoin, um, we obviously take the complexity out of custody or platform risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and number two, when you hold HUT, you're holding not only a call option on the future price appreciation of Bitcoin for like almost a, for a, at a huge discount. I mean, we're trading, we've sold off like everyone else in this market. So you can get in on HUD at a very reasonable price right now. And so we're not only a call option on the future price of Bitcoin, but also a call option on the growth of this industry and the growth of the high performance computing industry, which Google Google it, the, the, the forecast cagers on both of those, that the, those industries is extraordinary. And HUD is effectively a call option on the both of on the growth of both crypto and HPC. Yeah. Okay. And I'm holding shares and call options on the call option. So I'm double call option in here. Okay. Uh, okay. And then just the second part there. So what separates you guys? I know the HPC is the one, uh, the Canadian um, focus we talked about. Any other kind of key differentiators that, that hold on for dear life strategy? Anything we haven't touched on here? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, again, almost 9,000 Bitcoin unencumbered, completely diversified business, Canadian domiciled. But again, we're, we, we would certainly be open to maybe going south of the border again if, if the deal made sense, because growth is certainly on our radar. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what I'm personally really excited about is, is, is the data that shows just how miners are able to actually be a complement to renewable grids and, and help fortify renewable grids. So I'm hoping that we come out with some cool, um, you know, in greater involvement in that sector as well in 2023. That's not me disclosing anything. I'm just saying that me, Sue, Sue as a one of the executives of this company, um, I'm personally pushing for that because um, ESG is a big focus for us. Um, so, so yeah, no, I think we've covered everything. And again, always happy to chat with you. Oh, wait, no, we haven't covered our new amazing CFO, Shenif, that we're really- Yeah, I saw that. Shenif is a boss. Um, he comes from, he was at IBM for 18 years. Him and Jamie worked together at IBM. Jamie was also at IBM for, I think, eight years. Um, and then they worked also at a company called Kojiko. So they have a wicked vibe. He is brilliant. He has numbers and we're super excited to have him on board. Um, so hopefully you guys can meet him in January, February. Um, and yeah, that's, that's another sort of killer app that we're excited about is our new CFO. 
Great. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the time. Um, any closing thoughts for, I'll leave a link to the website in the video description below. Any closing thoughts for the viewers here, Sue? That's it. Love your channel, love your audience and happy to chat anytime. Okay, great. Guys, thanks so much for watching today. If you're still here, make sure you hit the thumbs up. Leave a comment below if we didn't get to any of your questions. We'll be happy to answer them in the next video. I appreciate you guys watching. Thanks for the time today. We'll see you in the next update.